Hello, and thanks for joining us for yet another episode of Space Nuts. My name is Andrew Dunkley. Coming up in episode 307, we're going to Mars. A couple of things on Mars. The copter, Ingenuity, has done some more amazing things and set a couple of records. And we've found out why Mars is perpetually dusty. I suspect it's dust, but <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll be talking about that. They've also discovered through Hubble why Uranus and Neptune are different colours. Do I need to elaborate? <laughs> uh, we will. Uh, we'll also be answering a couple of questions about neutron stars and escaping the Milky Way in a spaceship, I assume. Apparently difficult. We'll uh, try and figure that one out on this episode of Space Nuts. Stick around. 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 10, 9, ignition sequence start. Space Nuts. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Space Nuts. Astronauts report it feels good. And joining me, as he always does, is astronomer at large, Professor Fred Watson. Hello, Fred. Hello, Andrew. Yes, still at large. They haven't called me yet. <laughs> no, they haven't. <laughs> but they might. Yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> Who knows? Uh, just keep running, Fred. Although I find at my age, running is not ideal. Don't enjoy it at all. Well, that's all right, because at my age, running is impossible. So. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's get on to our first topic, and we've got a couple of stories from Mars, the first being that the the Ingenuity Mars helicopter is in the news again. This thing is just doing some amazing stuff, and it keeps making the news for that reason, and this is another one of those stories. Isn't it a great story, Andrew? Such a, yeah. you know, who would have thought a helicopter on Mars to start with, one that works, one that does a sensational job, but that keeps on breaking its own records, which is fantastic. Uh, I think when we spoke about Ingenuity at first, it was expected to complete five flights, of which the mm. first three were going to be testing out all the kit, and the other two were whatever they could do. The moment Ingenuity is preparing for its 29th flight, so it's wow. doing a marvellous job. And obviously the, you know, the team built it, put their heart and soul into it and did all the right things because it's been a, a work of art in terms of what it has achieved. And the reason why it's, I mentioned record-breaking is that um, back in April, on the 18th of April, it actually had a record-breaking flight because it was the furthest and fastest flight to date. And I've got the figures here in both sorts of units. It's 704 metres, 0.7 of a kilometre. That's a significant distance, which is 2,310 feet. And it achieved a speed of 12 miles per hour, which is 5.5 metres per second. So certainly, um, well, you can probably run a bit faster than that. Maybe not, <laughs> but don't uh, think so. Uh, but it is. It's a it's a it's a fast pace, and yeah, you'd, you'd have trouble keeping up with it. I think anybody. So yeah. fabulous stuff, and still doing you know sterling work. That record breaking flight, you can actually find footage of it on the web. I'm looking as we often do. Andrew, the fizz.org website, and there is footage of the flight, which has actually been compressed. It's speeded up five times. So Yeah, I'm so, just watching it now. Yeah, isn't it great? So you, yeah. you've got um, you've got a sort of footage of the surface of Mars gliding by beneath you from an altitude of 10 metres or 33 mm. feet. A lovely quote from uh, Teddy San Sanetos, I think is his name. He's at JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Uh, for our record-breaking flight, Ingenuity's downward-looking navigation camera provided us with a breathtaking sense of what you would feel like gliding 33 feet above the surface of Mars at 12 miles per hour. That's exactly what you get. And it is. It's great. It's lovely. Yes, it is. And I suppose while it's still operational, they'll keep operationaling it. They'll keep going uh, because... You sent it up there for a reason. Okay, it's it's done everything they wanted it to do. But now I suppose it's it's an opportunity to really test this thing to the limit of limit of its capability and just kept keep pressing on to see what else they can learn and it opens the door to what may be able to be done in future missions to Mars. Exactly. Yeah. And and I suspect, you know, the mission controllers here, they've probably got a little bit of 
dichotomy because they 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 probably want to do just what you've said test the thing to the limit see wow. see how far you can push it how fast it can go how far it can go before something goes wrong and it and it's broken but yeah. the, the problem is with that that this little helicopter has turned out to be really useful in terms of finding the way for the Perseverance rover, checking mm. what's beyond the next ridge, you know, looking for rocks that uh, have got interesting features to them, and essentially just scouting out the landscape around Perseverance, which is, I'm sure, what mission controllers hoped it would do when it was being developed. Because yeah. remember, all it's got on board is a camera, a navigation camera, and I think there might be two, but the navigation camera is certainly the, the main one, the downward pointing one, because it uses that to, to find its way autonomously. It's got its own brain inside. Nobody's controlling it because you can't do that from, from the Earth with the long time interval between signals going up and coming back. So it thinks for itself. I think um, the mission controllers say, I want you to go there, <laughs> and off it goes and works out the, all the details itself. So it's a remarkable and such a such an achievement there. I think I'm correcting myself there. I think I said there might be two cameras. I don't think there are. I think there's only the navigation camera. On board. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, I wonder how far it could go away from perseverance before you know it was irretrievable is it tethered to perseverance by radio or anything or is um, it totally it, autonomous i think i think it is you know maybe i think most of the hardware is actually sort of computing hardware is on board the per, the ingenuity the helicopter but it certainly would talk to perseverance yes without doubt that there were I think they've already smashed the records that they expected to achieve. If I remember rightly, it's when it was built, I might be remembering the wrong number here, but 150 metres or 160 metres sticks in my mind as being its maximum range. Mm. And yet this record-breaking flight is, you know, five times that or thereabouts, yeah. 704 metres. So it's um, it's already pushing the limits. I guess what the worst thing might happen is if its batteries failed in flight. Although I think the sensors on board would tell the autonomous system, look, your batteries are running out, you better get down to the ground. Because uh, if, if the batteries failed in flight, that could be catastrophic. You know, if it landed on a, on a surface that had a, a hidden rock or something and tipped over, I think that would be the end of the story as well. Yeah. You want that solar panel, which is absolutely essential for keeping the battery topped up. That's got to be facing upwards. And if it's pointing downwards, it's end of story, I think. Yeah. Well, we've heard stories like that about other rovers. Yes, and yes, indeed. That have lost Put, the power because they just couldn't get uh, couldn't exposure get the to the solar energy. So, yeah, Philae. Yes, it's always a risk. Of it. Exactly what happened with Philae on the Rosetta yep. mission. Yeah. Yep. But incredible so far and can't wait to hear more about what they're up to with ingenuity. Let's stay on Mars, Fred, because it's uh, it's a dusty place. It's perpetually dusty and they think they now know why. Now, it might seem strange for us to actually be trying to come up with an explanation as to why Mars is dusty because it's a red planet and it's got weather. So you would think, well, duh. Yes. It's going to be dusty, but this this is a permanent haze. It is, that's right. And it's why the sky's slightly pink on Mars, because that's the dust must be a born haze. Yeah, you, you're familiar with some of the dust storms that we can get on Earth, you know, those mm. gigantic yeah. clouds of dust that come in western New South Wales from time to time. And they get that on Mars as well. They get these enormous dust storms, sometimes blanket the entire planet. The last time that happened, I think, was 2018. Um, yeah which um, is, you know, curiosity. The, the rover that was on Mars got, got a fairly solid coating of dust on that. But even when there's no, there's no global dust storms, it's still a hazy planet. And so essentially, what is it that keeps the dust particles aloft? That's the, the, the big question. And the studies that have been done, and this is research that's coming out of multinational team of researchers from uh, the USA, Spain, France, Finland, looking, of course, at uh, data from Perseverance and other rovers on the surface of Mars. The, uh, they have demonstrated that those huge dust storms that we've just been talking about are not enough, not often enough, to 
explain why the planet's always hazy. Mm. Uh, and so what they've done is they've they've looked at the Perseverance rover and what it can tell them. And in particular, Perseverance has a set of sensors which are known, which are called the Mars Environment Dynamics Analyzer. Mars, en- Mars Environment Dynamics Analyzer. I'm having trouble reading stuff today, aren't you? Otherwise known as MEDA or MEDA, M-E-D-A. And that's got, it's a weather station, basically. The air pressure, temperature, wind speed. It's probably not much point trying to measure humidity because it's, it's usually about one or something like that. But anyway, it also has equipment that lets you analyze the sunlight to see how much light is scattered through dust. So that tells you how much dust there is in the atmosphere. And it's in fact, um, I think it's connected with the dynamics analyzer that the Mars microphone is installed because we've talked about that too. Anyway, the so the, the results from that are really interesting. And one is, and it's Probably not that much of a surprise, but the dust devils, these little whirlwinds that you're familiar with in western New South Wales. Very familiar. Yeah, we get some really big ones here. Yeah, yeah, I used to see them uh, when I lived in Coonabarabran. Uh, They are apparently more frequent than was expected. And why? reason why that doesn't surprise me that much is that I've more than probably a decade and a half now, I've been showing, if I talk about Mars, I tend to show a little video clip that came from, uh, it was one of the early rovers, Spirit, I think. Uh, yes, the Spirit rover, not Opportunity. Spirit and Opportunity were the pair of rovers back in the early 2000s. Spirit sat itself on top of a mountain range called, um, actually it's one mountain called Husband Hill. It's in the the Challenger range. All the peaks in that range are named after people who were lost in the Challenger disaster. Husband Hill is one of them, and they they looked at the landscape beyond, and there's all these dust devils charging across the landscape. So just one little bit of footage from one spot on Mars, and what do you get? Dust devils. Apparently that is common to Mars, certainly at least in the equatorial regions where most of these landers have found themselves, including Perseverance. Mm. And the suggestion from this research is that at least one dust devil is generated in the vicinity of the rover every day, and that's sort of more common than we get here on Earth. Yeah. So the uh, dust devils on Mars, of course, are quite different from the ones on Earth. I think the biggest one I ever saw, and it was actually driving back from Coonamble in western New South Wales towards Coonabarabran, and it would have been, my guess is 500 metres high. That's pretty tall for a, yes. a, an earthly dust devil. We, um, we were driving home from Queensland once in a very dry time of the year, and I think the region was in drought, and we were driving across the Moree Plains, yes, which yeah. is, well, north of us, a few yeah. hours north of us. And we saw two massive dust devils, and yeah, they they would have easily been two or three hundred meters high, just yeah. big yeah. red tornado like structures. Amazing. But that's right. Uh, gosh, quite quite extraordinary to watch. Yeah. So we had one. We actually had since we've lived in this place. I've had two dust devils come over the top of me while I've been in the backyard. Oh, really? And the updraft is quite incredible. And yes, all the, it will be. Know, cleaned all the, the yard, picked up all the leaves, took it away. Didn't have to. <laughs> <Put> <laughs> it's quite put amazing. Somewhere else. I stayed still. But <laughs> it's a good thing yeah, you did. They just pick up so much stuff. They're, uh, they're amazing. That's the beauty, of course, with these dust devils. In With the earlier rover, Spirit and Opportunity, they, they cleaned off the solar panels. The dust yeah. devils going by actually swept the solar panels clear, clear of dust. Now, Curiosity and Perseverance have both got um, thermoelectric nuclear generators, so they, do, they don't have solar panels. But really interesting. Yeah, that's, Now, uh, I, I assume the dust devils on Mars, you said they're different, so I'm guessing they wouldn't be nearly as big, or are they bigger? They're eight kilometres. Whoa! <laughs> yeah. Whoa! <laughs> yeah, they're, they're huge. I think I'm remembering that number correctly. They're, they are very, very tall. And it's, it's partly that the dust is very fine, but also the gravity is lower. Of course, against that is the atmospheric pressure being low, so you wouldn't think the winds would whip up as much, but they do. And the other thing about them, because of the low humidity, Andrew, here's, here's one that would be a surprise on Earth. You get little, little flashes of lightning in the base of them. 
uh, as the dust particles rub against one another, they gener- generate static electricity. So get these little flashes of, of lightning. And uh, I've seen footage of these being captured. <clears throat> so different sorts of dust devils from what we get. But they have got a role in cleaning up the, you know, the, the spacecraft there, which is very nice. However, there is another aspect, though, to to why Mars is dusty, and that is that that there's a phenomenon which essentially generates uh, wind patterns, what they call daytime upslope winds. Okay. So it's it's something again. It's not not as common as the dust devils, but essentially just a phenomenon of atmospheric heating that gives you these these rising winds. They they blow up the slopes. And once again, good old fizz.org's got a lovely piece of footage of, of this actually happening, a, a gust lifting event, uh, actually top of a hill there, showing quite clearly a huge patch of dust being carried by the wind, you know, as it rises up the slope. And that is now thought to be another major contributor to why Mars has this constant atmospheric haze. Yeah, quite amazing. We have similar things happen on Earth, particularly in uh, desert regions. Yes. But I, yes. I, I was quite struck by coming into land in Dubai and looking yep. out the window and just this red haze in the sky all the yes. time, and it's it's there all the time. Yeah. So it's the yeah. same kind of situation, probably a different effect. But, yeah, I can imagine that that's, that's what Mars would be like uh, in yeah. terms of the everyday is seeing this constant redness in the sky and that's that's what it's like around the united arab emirates and i'm sure many other desert countries it's it's quite incredible but yeah i I noticed that going in there i think it would be the same in parts of the u.s some of those more Mm -hmm. desert like areas around las vegas and and similar but yeah well we know what it is now it's wind and meant to mention and and dust devils. I meant to mention there's a great scene in the movie The Martian. I know I've talked about The Martian many times and uh, it's a great movie. I love it. But there's a great scene where he's driving the rover along this plains area on Mars and they've put a beautiful piece of music into the scene where he's driving through these dancing dust devils. It's really yeah. worth seeing. Yeah. It's only a very <laughs> short scene, like five or ten seconds. Yeah. But... It impacted on me greatly because it was just so beautifully done. I know it was all CGI, et cetera, et cetera, but it was okay. it was a brilliant <laughs> scene. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I'd watch that scene again just to watch the whole movie again because it's it's so well well done and just it just sort of gives you that um that impact of isolation and desolation all at once. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I think that uh, that's a great piece of uh cinematography. Yeah, so now we know. This is Space Nuts. Oh, by the way, if you want to uh, read that article, fizz.org is the website. You're listening to Space Nuts with Andrew Dunkley and Professor Fred Watson. Okay, we checked all four systems and team with a go. Space Nuts. Okay, Fred, let's move on from Mars to a couple of other planets in our solar system. And they're planets we do talk about occasionally, but they don't seem to get as much attention as the um, the likes of Saturn and Jupiter. We're talking about Uranus and Neptune. Now, I didn't even think about this as an issue, but obviously somebody has been going, <laughs> I wonder why they are different colours. And they've been analysing this through the Hubble Space Telescope and they think they've figured it out. Exactly. <clears throat> and it, in some ways... It- Sort of follows on a little bit from the last story because it's all about haze. <laughs> so what we've got is these two ice giants, Uranus and Neptune, Uranus the nearer to the to the sun, uh, and slightly larger than Neptune. Um, they, but generally, you can you can classify them together. Their masses are not too different, and their sizes are not too different either. And their atmospheric composition is very similar, and yeah. yet they they have a different appearance. And I'm going to, for the, this is beautifully put in the um, Hubble Space Telescope press release that I'm looking at, which is entitled Hubble Helps Explain Why Uranus and Neptune Are Different Colours. What they say is at visible wavelengths, Neptune is a rich, deep, azure hue, whereas Uranus is a distinctly pale shade of cyan. And that's 
It's almost greenish, actually. Is is your yes? Right? I've uh, seen photos that yeah. actually suggested it was closer to green. Yeah, I mean, a lot of often in photos, it it's the color balance of you know what you're looking at that that determines what color they look like. But yes, so so th- this is this is the formal analysis: a rich deep azure for Neptune, and a di- distinctly pale shade of cyan for, for Uranus. Uh, and before, before you go on to explain why, yes. I'm wondering why we would assume they should be the same colour. Um, and it's because of the similarities. Uh, so when you Which look you're at... suggested, yeah. Yeah, the, and in particular, I think, the atmospheric composition, because they're sort of rich in, in methane and, you know, um, hydrogen and all the, the normal sort of elements, but they have uh, strong similarities. And I think the bottom line here, Andrew, is that because of the similarities in the composition of the atmosphere, albeit Neptune's is a bit colder because it's further further away from the sun, but because of that, you might expect that they would look identical. Right. And, and they don't. And so what is what is being done is first of all, lots and lots, excuse me, lots and lots of observations of Neptune and Uranus from the Hubble Space Telescope, as well as actually ground-based telescopes, including Gemini North, that's in Hawaii. Not very far from it is NASA's own infrared telescope facility, the IRTF, which is one of the oldest telescopes on Mauna Kea in Hawaii. Mm. And they've used observations from that as well. And what they've done is, and I should say that these these researchers are led by a professor of planetary physics at Oxford University, but with other collaborators. His name is Patrick Irwin. Um, what they've done is they've analysed all the observations, but they've also built models of what these atmospheres look like. And I think essentially there's a bit of simplification going on here, but what they've got is a three-layer model of the atmospheres of both of the planets. Um, and it turns out that those are the three layers are differentiated by the 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 amount of aerosols that there are in so particles essentially within those layers that different heights and it turns out that what the layer that affects the color is the middle layer <laughs> and it's in fact they call it the aerosol 2 layer because it's the middle of the three uh, and it's apparently thicker on uranus than it is on neptune but what they what they believe is happening is that you send, essentially have methane ice which condenses onto the haze particles whatever they are they dust of some form uh, yeah. and that sort of pulls the those haze particles deeper into the atmosphere. I love the language here. In a shower of methane snow, uh, so you've got this snow falling through Neptune's atmosphere, so uh, through Uranus's atmosphere. Big pun. That's on both of them. So you've right. got that effect on both of them. But it turns out that Neptune has a much more turbulent atmosphere than Uranus. And we know that Neptune has some of the highest winds in the solar system. Do, so you've do got Fred, this... that surprises me, that it's more <laughs> turbulent on Neptune. Yeah, it Uranus. does a bit, because you'd think Uranus being close to the sun would have more heat going into the... That's not what I was thinking. I know, I know. Anyway. I'm trying to clean up your act, Andrew. <laughs> Lift your game. Not doing... <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> anyway, notwithstanding all that... What they say, the turbulent atmosphere of Neptune, for whatever reason that might be, they suggest that that atmosphere is is better, sort of essentially churning up, as they put it, these these methane particles to produce the snow. And it keeps the haze out of the way. That's the bottom line. It has this snow going down, gets the haze out of this important layer, and that is why we see the neptune is we see what you might call its true color um it's it's blue and 
Uranus would look like Neptune, except that it's got more of this haze, which kind of whitens it slightly. That's the basically the bottom line of the research. Um, one of the other uh, collaborators in this work, who's at uh, University of California, Berkeley, Mike Wong, says, we hope that developing this model would help us understand clouds and hazes in the ice giant atmospheres. Explaining the difference in colour between Uranus and Neptune was an unexpected bonus. It's quite nice that they've done that. But they now see that this, this whitening effect of the of the more of the larger amounts of haze in that middle layer of Uranus's atmosphere is why it looks paler. It's why it doesn't look as deep a blue as Neptune mm. does. Get rid of the haze and it would look just the same. Yeah, yeah. Does that suggest they had identical origins or perhaps... Came yeah, from the same place. Yeah, it's possible. That's right. Um, I mean, they are suspiciously close together in when well, they're adjacent in the solar system. They're a long way apart as planets are at that distance. But, yeah. um, but they are. Um, yeah, they they may have had a common origin. You know, they formed mm. in the same bit of the protoplanetary disk that surrounded the sun. So yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, mm. it's it's nice stuff. They also actually, uh, incidentally, they've investigated some of the other aspects because both of um, both of those gas giant planets, or the ice giants, Uranus and Neptune, they have dark spots on them, which are interpreted as being atmospheric storms. And in fact, some of the you know the Voyager pictures show some of those dark spots. And the, this this modelling that they've produced actually explains what gives them the darker appearance, and also why they're easy, more easily seen on Uranus than Neptune. Really interesting research, and they're to be congratulated, I think, on sort of answering so many questions. About about these two mysterious planets. Yes, yes, indeed. And uh, again, if you do want to read that article or the media information from Hubble, it's on the esahubble.org website, esahubble.org. And I did st- state at the beginning of this particular segment, Fred, that we, we tend not to spend as much time talking about these two planets. We, we focus more on the, uh, the rocky planets and the, and the gas giants. But I, I've been doing a little bit of research while you've been talking, and apparently the reason we don't pay as much attention is, particularly in the case of Uranus, is that there, there's a significant risk in staring at Uranus too long. <laughs> Because you could get arrested. <laughs> Dear, irascible is the it. word. Irascible. Yes, you had to do it. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> to do it. Oh, dear. You uh, are I'm listening a, to Space Nut. Yeah, Sorry. I, I was going to say I'm as guilty. It wasn't my fault that I wrote a no. book called Why is Uranus Upside Down? It was the publishers who chose that. <laughs> <laughs> Not me. It's the best-selling that's book I've ever story, written. You're sticking to it. <laughs> yeah. Yes. He's going to have to update it so that he can change the colour of the spot That's on Uranus exactly right. Too, yes, yes. I think it's brown. <laughs> this is Space Nuts with Andrew Dunkley and Fred yeah. Watson. Yes. <laughs> Space Nuts. Okay, Fred, let's tackle some questions. We've got a few to go through today. Two of them focus on neutron stars. We did talk about neutron stars well, a couple of times recently including the mountains on neutron stars, which are, what, three millimetres yeah. high? Yes, yeah. that's right. Uh, anyway, that seems to have provoked people. Well, you know, they've come up with some questions. This one from Christian. Hi, I love the podcast, and I've got a question I'd like to ask. If you could stop a neutron star spinning and get up close, would its surface be like a mirror, or does its density and weird physics make it a translucent crystal? Really enjoying listening to you both. Take it easy. Christian Tadman. Thanks, Christian. Uh, yeah, well, it's a big ask, stopping a neutron star and then getting close <laughs> to it. Let's just assume you can for a moment. Yeah. <clears throat> yes. I think look, <clears throat> I think the answer is that it wouldn't look like a crystal because we know that neutron stars have structure. In fact, they contain not just neutrons but protons as well, which is where the magnetic you know, fields and things come from. I understand it. Their surface is, is structured like uh, like proton, uh, you know, the emphasis on protons. The neutrons are concentrated in, in the centre, in the core. So it's, it's already got structure which probably would rule out it being transparent and something you could see through, like a, a crystal ball. But, of course, it's also got a hugely hot Surface temperature typically around six hundred thousand degrees Kelvin. Um, 
So that means that the radiation that would be leaving it is firmly in the ultraviolet. Bless you, Andrew. Thank you. Uh, and uh, so, so, yeah, it's, uh, it's a very weird and wonderful place. Now, the reason why we can see neutron stars is because of the fact they beam out the, you know, the uh, radiation, the radio radiation along their their axes, their, their magnetic axes. In other words, their north and south magnetic poles are where it beams out from. And the fact that they're rotating, sometimes up to 43,000 revolutions per minute, which is astonishing for a star, um, that rapid rotation is why we see these lighthouse pulses of light that we call pulsars. So they come from neutron stars. I think you have a follow-up uh, neutron star question, is that Yes, right? yes, we've got another yeah. question, but yeah, yeah. stopping a neutron star, if anyone could ever do that, that would... Um... <laughs> They would have all the power in the universe, I imagine. Yeah, they probably would. Yeah, the uh, second question is an audio question. This one comes from Simon. Hi, guys. Uh, love the show. My name's Simon. I know I'm from the UK, but living in New York. Uh, my question is specifically about neutron stars, which absolutely fascinate me, even perhaps more than, than black holes. Uh, my question is, you know, assuming that you would, survive the radiation and the, and the crushing gravity, could you actually walk on the surface of a neutron star? Uh, it would seem that they are so dense that, that you could actually walk on it. Uh, my, my next question is, them being so dense, how do they actually emit any radiation? I, I don't quite understand how that how that might work. Um, I'm dying to know what what Fred uh, Fred can tell me there. Uh, anyway, great show. Love it. Love every episode. It's uh, the best podcast there is going. Keep up the great work, guys. That's nice. Uh, thank you so much, Simon. Uh, so a double header. Can you walk on the neutron star? And- <laughs> Well, it's easy to climb the mountains, that's for sure. Yeah, and I think that's a clue to the answer to that question, Andrew, that we've we've talked about mountains on neutron stars, and you're right, they're a couple of millimetres tall, which suggests that they would have a solid surface. And I think that's really what Simon's asking. You know, do they have a solid surface? Yes, of course, the gravitational pull would crush you to, a, <laughs> well, nothing really. And, and the radiation would be a problem, but... It's, it does seem that they do have a, a solid surface. So the other part of Simon's question about why, you know, a neutron star can emit radiation at all because of that gravitational field is a good one. The answer is that they do, because of course we see the evidence from the the beams of radiation that are channeled out along their magnetic poles, and um, the. The magnetic fields themselves contribute to that because they are huge, up to one quadrillion times stronger than the Earth's magnetic field, which apparently is 10 to the power 15. So uh, there's a clue there too, because black holes do the same thing. Uh, Their magnetic fields are so intense that they can squirt jets of material out from their poles. And we talked recently about the one that's tilted over with respect to its accretion disk. So... That intense gravity is not necessarily a barrier to stuff leaving it if there are other strong forces as well. But the bottom line with a neutron star is it's not a black hole. So it doesn't have an event horizon, which is that point beyond which you can't see anything because light itself cannot escape for a black hole. So neutron stars still allow radiation to escape from the surface and that's why we can see them. It's why we can observe them directly. Unlike black holes, which we can only observe by virtue of the effect they're having on their, their surroundings, the, you know, the radio radiation that comes from the accretion disk with all the material jostling and charging up to very high energies. Very good. Thank you, Simon. And thank you, Christian, for your questions about neutron stars. And we've got a question from Duncan. This is sort of a science fiction question. Hello, Duncan here from Weymouth in the UK. Just a quick question. Many sci-fi series, such as Star Trek, Star Wars, etc., depict escaping from the Milky Way in a spaceship as being very hazardous. I just wondered if indeed that is the case. If you were out there in a spaceship, would you be able to 
escape the Milky Way easy? Or is there some huge barrier or reason why you couldn't some, I don't know, shear as you head, head out of the Milky Way? Um, I don't know, really. Just a quick thought. I mean, I couldn't think of any particular reason why it would be different. I imagine it would just get thinner and thinner with stars and eventually there'd be nothing around you. But I don't know. Just wondered what your opinion on it was. Thanks. Mm, thank you, Duncan. Love the accent, by the way. <laughs> I must confess I, I don't recall ever <laughs> hearing it portrayed in any science fiction that I've watched or read that it's difficult to get out of the um, the galaxy or uh, anything to that effect. But obviously uh, Duncan's come across it. Uh, would it be hard to f- sort of launch yourself beyond the galaxy and get out into interstellar space? If you had enough time, you no, know, you could do it. You know, it takes a few we've got time. Few billion years, yeah, because the speeds we move at compared with the size of the galaxy is, it will take a long time. I think, um, I think though, Duncan's right uh, in that as you, you know, it's, if you imagine the Milky Way itself, its structure. So you've got this disk of stars and gas and dust. You've got a halo, a much more rarefied sphere, mostly of stars, not much gas in there, globular clusters as well, which gets thinner as the further away you get. So the if you were leaving sort of perpendicular to the disk, you'd first of all have to cope with all the disk stars, and that's fairly highly populated in the vicinity of the sun. But then you'd start going through the halo, which is much more rarefied, not much gas and dust to speak of. And beyond that, you're in the intergalactic space. Yeah. So I think there isn't a what you might call a physical barrier, but the main barrier is the gravitational one. So the you know the, the galaxy sits in a gravitational well. Its gravitational pull is more than what you would expect from what you can see because we know there's dark matter there that's tending to, to hold it together. And when you add all the matter together, the baryonic or normal matter plus the dark matter, that means that you've got this gravitational force or gravitational pull to overcome. And that's it's not ridiculously high. It means that what it means is that the our galaxy has an escape velocity, just like a planet does or a star. Yeah. On the surface of the Earth, to get off the Earth altogether, you have to be travelling at more than 11 kilometres per second. That's the escape velocity from the Earth. And we know that the galaxy has an escape velocity. And in fact, some of the work I did a decade or so ago, along with many collaborators, actually allowed us to measure the escape velocity of the galaxy. The International Rave Survey that I was project manager for, RAVE being the radial velocity experiment, we measured the velocities and other characteristics of half a million stars in our galaxy, fairly locally in the galaxy. But by looking at their motion, you can actually calculate what the escape velocity would be at our in our neck of the woods, our part of the galaxy. And I... I'm trying to remember because it's a decade or so ago that we did this, but I think it's around about 240 kilometers per second. So considerably more than the Earth, of course, uh, to leave the galaxy. So you'd need a lot more thrust than you do to get it off the Earth. But it's not inconceivable that you could achieve a velocity of that sort of magnitude, a couple of hundred kilometers per second. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, that would be, I think, the main barrier to leaving our Milky Way galaxy. Velocity. Velocity, that's right. Velocity and gravity, yeah, okay. Duncan, a... thank you. Really good question. Love, love those kinds of uh, what-if questions. And you prepared for a, a question without notice, Fred? I am. I am yeah, indeed. we got one uh, through our um, YouTube feed a little while ago, and it uh, basically comes from Ollie. He said, I guess I was wondering as I take astrophotos, and of course I can adjust the colour as I please, I wonder how people like Fred who analyse these photos from a scientific standpoint, if they're specific colour, calibration rules they need to adhere to, etc., or if it's not an issue. He said, sorry, not well explained, but look, I understood it. So yeah, <laughs> Fred, no, what, a, what do you reckon? It's a great uh, question. And actually, yeah. look, the person who is the absolute master the maestro on this is david malin my yep. colleague and good friend we had dinner together a couple of nights ago david 
pioneered the technique of putting true colour into celestial images back in the 70s and 80s. And the calibration processes that he went through were interminable, calibrated them to death. Uh, and it's all about, you know, not just getting white balance, it's, it's just about the, the gamma curves and all, all these fancy terms that you use in, in imagery to get them all matched so that what you're seeing is, would, is an absolutely true representation of what you would see if your eyes were millions of times more sensitive. And it's that, because other astronomers knew that these images had been so well calibrated, that led them to be able to make scientific discoveries from them, just because they, they knew that the colours represented real, you know, the real effect. So it's a great question, and if David was sitting here now, he'd be talking for the next half hour about how he did it. <laughs> uh, so the answer to your question, Ollie, is yes, but we don't know what those specifics well, are in terms of colour calibration, but I suppose it's circumstantial to what you're photographing. It, to some extent, it depends on your technique. Look, it's pretty easy yeah. to, to find. I mean, in a sense, the question's well made because a lot of that calibration is now taken care of in the software that you can get, which essentially, yeah. you know, it's artificial David Merlin is some of the software you're, you're talking about because it does those calibrations for you. Mm. All right. Thanks, Ollie, and thanks for listening live. Good to hear from you. Yeah. And uh, don't forget, if you've got questions or comments or ideas, hypotheticals that you want to send through to us, you can do that via our website, spacenutspodcast.com. Click on the AMA link to uh, send us a, a text question or an audio question, or you can click on the tab on the right-hand side of the homepage to send us an audio question as well. And while you're there, check out how to become a patron if you want to uh, support us financially because there are lots of people that do that these days and we really appreciate it. And there are various ways, Patreon, Supercast, or you can just click on the Buy Us a Cup of Coffee button and make a one-off small donation, or you can leave a review on your favourite podcast distributor. The more reviews, the more people that uh, get... Um, the attention of us or we get the attention of them and uh, the, the bigger our Space Nuts community grows. So, uh, yeah, you can leave reviews through whatever platform you, you listen on. Fred, that uh, wraps it up for another episode. Thank you so much. They come around so quickly. <laughs> they do. It's a great they pleasure, do. Andrew. Always great to talk and looking forward to the next time. We'll see you next week. Professor Fred Watson, astronomer at large. And from me, Andrew Dunkley, thanks for listening. We'll catch you on the very next episode of Space Nuts. Bye-bye. Space Nuts. You'll be listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Available at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or your favourite podcast player. You can also stream on demand at Bytes.com. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.